Okay, so, so the last talk will be about motion, because so far we have talked about uh, creating shapes we, Im we imagine, but it was mostly static shapes, then shapes that can be uh, printed and put into motion with the last talk, but of course with virtual motion we can do much more. So can, how, how can we use these creative interfaces such as sketch-based sketch modeling and sculpting for creating motion? And I will first come back to what Spike said this morning. So if, if you look at this, this animation here, this is where we, we, uh, we have gone, the further uh, uh, we have gone, if it works. Okay, used to work. Okay, it doesn't. Let's try. Okay, so, so le let us look on the, on the right here. And you, so it's, it's finally uh, eight years ago, the further we had gone with virtual clay, and when we manage, after years of research, to improve what Spike did in the early years, to have a virtual clay that was working in real time, we realized that to, to be able to sculpt something with this clay, we needed, uh, we, we needed to have our, ha our own hands in the real uh, world. At that time, I had Paul Cry working in my group as a postdoc, so he invited this nice device called the Hand Navigator to be able to, be, to, to drive people's hand in the virtual world. And after all this work, we realized that trying to inspire from the way we interact in, in the real world was not really a good idea, which, which was exactly the conclusion of Spike's talk. On the other hand, we were also been, been trying to get inspired by sketching and painting systems, so this is a system with the sketch-based modeling, uh, with painting, with implicit surfaces, a little bit similar to the one Joachim demonstrated. And with this system, which was much farther away uh, with the way people interact in real, because here you infer 3D from a 2D sketch, then even kids in, within 15 minutes were able to, to do stuff. So this was only for metaphor, inspired from the physical world, for only static shapes. Now, when, in, when, when it comes to motion, if you want to inspire from physical media, you have much more, not more, much to inspire from, because, of course, physical media is very limited to depict motion. You, you can try to sketch motions, there are two examples here. You can try to sculpt motion, which is even more limited, but here there is really something new to invent. In fact, digital media is giving us the first opportunity to sketch and sculpt animated content because it doesn't exist in real. So this is one of the stuff we wanted to explore in my group. Do these ideas of sketching and sculpting can really be extended to media which is things that are moving, animated things, and it poses, it opens a number of new questions. Firstly, is sketching still the fastest way to create new content? You have seen today in most of the talk Creating a new stuff was done by sketching rather than sculpting. Why? Because, as I show you in my own example, in fact, sketching proved much more, uh, for static shape at least, sketching is much more uh, um, efficient, practically, than trying to sculpt in, directly in 3D. So, it, so does the same apply to, to, to most 3D motion design? Then, is sculpting still the best metaphor for editing and refining existing motion? And if we try to sculpt motion, should we, do the, should we work at constant time and then interpolate, or can we do more? For instance, can we sculpt while the animation is running? Can we sketch in, in, in space, but also in, in time? Or how should we specify or edit the rhythm of a motion, independently from where it goes? So these are very interesting questions, and in this talk, I will just present briefly Two of the, the, the projects from students I co, I, I co advise. Uh, the first one is sculpting animated content, the example of crowd sculpting. So, this is a work from Kevin Jordao, who I, I co advise with Julien Petre, who is here. And the, and the second work is sketching in space and time for character animation, which is a work of Martin Gay, who I am uh, co advising with Rémi Ronfard. And then I'll try to extra extract a, a few challenges for the future and get to the general conclusion of this symposium. So uh, sculpting, in fact, was recently extended to structured shapes. So this is an example we did uh, with Antoine Millier, and was, uh, which was presented a few years ago. And so it's a way of sculpting 
shapes that are defined by puzzle grammars. And the idea is simple, in simple, you want to edit such shapes as if they were clay, by pushing, pulling, and, uh, and, 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 to, and what you want to do is that if you extend a wall, uh, all the tiny detail will duplicate, uh, the towers in a big wall will duplicate as well, and finally, it's, it's like if you were sculpting like castle material, and castle material being defined by the grammar that you can extract from the, from the shape. And uh, so this is done, if you look at how it is done, it is done with mutable elastic models. This means this mean that while you are manipulating the shape at the left, what you have is that the, the piece of the shape is, is automatically snapping to the closest, uh, the closest piece. Uh, uh, so if, if, for instance, if, if the, the wall bends too much, then a, a corner will be, will, will, will be um, inserted. If it's stretched too much, a new piece will be inserted and so forth. So our first work on sculpting motion was to generalize that, this to animated content. And we did it with a, sp a, a specific type of existing animated content. This is crowd animation. Crowd animation da data is like a space-time puzzle if you model it with crowd patches. Crowd patches, depicted here with these little trajectories, uh, are like little trajectories that you can put together. So I give you an example here. So this is an example of a patch. You have some static obstacles. And then you have a few, t you have, this is also a static obstacle. And then you have some in and out points here. And you have trajectories connecting these points. You need to have the same number of, of, of points in and out. And then you can have different characters. Look, the trajectories are the same, but it's a bunch of different characters that go into these trajectories. So this can be used like tile, like when we do texture-based tiling, but a tile that works in space and time. And so if you put together several of, the, of these crowd patch, patches, uh, you get something like this. So uh, in fact, uh, if, you re if I remove the border, you will not see the, yeah, you, you don't see what, where is the border between the, the crowd patches. And also the repetitivity of the trajectory, which is all periodic, is hidden because the trajectories are, uh, you have different characters that are, that are running, uh, uh, walking uh, on these trajectories. So in fact, you don't see too much repetitivity when you don't, you don't display the trajectories. So the advantage of using crowd patches is that it enables you to create unbounded animation. Unbounded in space, because you can just put an arbitrary number of crowd patches together, and unbounded in time, because it's all periodic motion. So uh, our first work for sculpting animation, first attempt, was, was to try to reuse the mutable elastic model I have demonstrated for the castle, but for this animated content. So the idea is to represent the connected crowd patches as well with a graph, and then extend mutable elastic model. So here, here is an example of the res kind of result you get. So while you are extending these crowd patches, other patches or corners are, ins uh, are inserted, depending on the motion you do. But here, it's, it, this, is, uh, this is really animated content. The animation is e it can be even running while you are doing the interaction. So this is a populated street, and you can as well copy, paste, and do has with, with clay, remove a little part, uh, then uh, uh, put it with the rest, cut, and, uh, and, and uh, freely shape, for instance, an animated village with a number of streets. So this is just a direct extension, and you have this content which is, which is uh, correct. So where we get stuck is more for temporal editing. Of course, with, with, this, uh, with these code patches, what we can do is superpose several interchangeable patches. Uh, then you can switch between these patches which have the same border constraint, but only at start of period, so that motion remains continuous. What is very interesting is that when you switch between patches, trajectories are totally discontinu visually discontinuous, but since they are, you only display them as one character uh, walking along those trajectories, the motion of this specific character can be continuous, even while the trajectories are discontinuous when you change the content. When you do that, what you manage to do is to edit the periodicity of motion. So this is the example. You have the first version of the central patch, and suddenly we switch to the second version of the central patch. I'll show it again. So if you look only at the little character, you would even not notice, and then you would just see that the, the periodicity of the central motion is different from the one 
uh, on the two sides. So the result of this work is mostly that space sculpting works fine. It works like sculpting shapes. But time sculpting, we, at least with this uh, crowd patches model, remains quite limited because motion cannot really be, be done to, to, to go faster or slower. This is because uh, if you wanted the central patch, the people in the central patch go twice faster or twice slower, there would be a problem of your boundary constraints with the other patches. So you would need then uh, to have change propagating over the other patches. And if you want in some parts that it goes faster, in other parts of the, of the little uh, city to go slower, then you, you will have density problems to be solved because some areas will need to be denser, other, other less dense, and this would need to be animated. So I think in this, so this is more to show, to sort of show the, the challenge. I think that there is a lot of, to do for sculpting this kind of data, uh, uh, animated data, both in space and also in time. Another project I would like to, to talk about is how we, we, create, uh, we create a new motion. So at the motion creating design stage, uh, uh, the current uh, software we get for designing motion is currently only available to train artists. This is an example from Estelle Charleroi, Charleroi who is a computer artist in our group. So uh, here you see the kind of interface you get for animating, uh, for instance, a flying dragon. The idea is how can we make a design of animation available not only to artists, but even to uh, to basic people. For, for, for these people, as I showed with the example of shapes created by children, similarly, we'd like children to be able to create motion in a very simple way. And here, we got inspired by the way artists uh, depict motion. And a very important concept that was introduced by artists was a line of action. They have shown that, that for sketching express, expressive characters, it's very important that from the camera viewpoint, from the viewpoint where you sketch, you have this line that represents kind of um, uh, the intent of the character and most often has an expressive C or S shape. And what is interesting also with this line it is, it, is that it is mostly, it is a line, uh, um, if, I can, if I can show it, So, uh, so you have uh, um, uh, alignment uh, in position, but also mostly in orientation, as you see in the purple circle. So you see that the limb of the character has the same orientation, has a line of action, but no, is not necessarily at the same place. So there is a kind of compromise between orientation, position and orientation. And so the first work we did uh, in, this, in this context was to, to try to use this line of action has a, uh, so the user sketch a line of action and to use it for automatically posing a 3D character. The idea is to interpret the line of action as a projective constraint. So you pose the character from the viewpoint in which you want to see, to show your movie, your film, your animation, and then automatically the character will, will align, not necessarily everywhere in position, but at least in position and or orientation. So this was, this was the first work Martin uh, Gay did. But if you do that, we have only advanced a very little step in the, in the context in, in, in making animation available to beginners. Because if you just take these 3D shapes and interpolate between them, you will not have the right timing. It will still be time consuming to take this animation. The second step is to move to more expressive K-framing. And then a very nice idea is the idea that you should interpolate not the character model in, in 3D, but maybe first interpolating the line of action in 2D can be very useful and much more expressive. So this, this led us to the concept of dynamic lines of action. So this dynamic line of action, what, what, what is, is nice is that, for instance, here uh, the, the, the user uh, would sketch here uh, three lines, so the lines which are, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, at, the, at the beginning, at the top of the motion, and at the right of the motion, and the system will interpolate and get the other lines. And then, uh, for each of those lines, you adjust the position of the 3D character. This can be done easily, 
by preserving uh, local length and favoring rotation along the line. So our solution involves smooth interpolation of root position, angle, and segment length. Okay, so this is a second step. We can get more expressive keyframe animation, but this is still keyframe. In order to make them even more expressive, we can also try to use some physically based keyframing. So this is a work that we, is going to appear in SBIM. And in this physically based uh, uh, keyframing, we, we just interpret the line of action as a kind of spring. So if you have a single line of action as a, in the top right corner, you can imagine like a spring releasing some uh, elastic energy and you can alway, already infer what the, the rest of the motion would be. But if you have several, for instance here, a final position and a last position, what we did is a system where uh, the, the line of action in 2D try to be physically based animated and to shoot through the, the next line of action that was depicted by the user. So we can, we can do that to add dynamics in sketches. Yet this is still the keyframing concept. If you do that, still the user has to design the animation by thinking, okay, at time one, I'm like this, time two, like this, and, and so on. We are not really using all the capabilities of a computer-aided system. So can we do better than that keyframes to design motion? In fact, an important thought is that a dynamic line of action is in fact a 2D surface. It's a 2D manifold that is living in a 2D space, the space, uh, uh, because if you look at this red line moving, so it's, it describes a, a surface over time. Of course, the surface can overlap can self-intersect if, the, if, if, the, if this little character was going back and forth. And, forth. and so finally, this uh, line of action that we were drawing using keyframing are only constant time slices of this surface. And for people who do here 3D modeling, you know that uh, sketching slices is not always the best way to design a nice looking, looking 3D surface. So the idea is that since we are designing a surface, can we do something else that just sketching constant time slices. Can we, can we initialize a dynamic line of action in a single gesture? And uh, can, can this way, this way can, can it enable us to control motion rhythm? Because this is what is completely like, lacking if you are doing this, uh, this keyframing kind of approach. Uh, motion rhythm is completely lacking from it. And so here again, we got inspired by the way artists are, are, are sketching motion. For instance, if they want to sketch a flying dragon, who it, who it, the body of the dragon is following a trajectory, then the artist would just sketch the trajectory, something that looks like the trajectory, but this, tra this blue tra trajectory on the top depict, depicts at the same time the trajectory of the dragon and the shape the body should take over time. So it's much more than just the trajectory for the center of gravity of this dragon. So this is for flying motion. For bouncing motion, we found the, the, the sketch here at the, at the middle, which is a mug which has been bouncing. And what is interesting is that you have this trajectory in blue, but if you look carefully at the shapes in red that the mug is taking over time, you can see that the red, most of the red shapes it takes can be already extracted from the bouncing trajectory because it just aligns to the trajectory. The shape is going back and forth because of this, uh, uh, the Disney, what we so-called Disney effect in computer animation. You have a follow-up, you have a, uh, um, and, and so, uh, of course, this, and, and, and at the bottom, you see a motion for looping. So usually when people want to represent this gymnast doing a, a jumping and doing a loop, they will just do a loop motion. And this can be inspiring as well for the trajectory, but also for the shape uh, of the body stacking over time. The, uh, using this kind of trajectories was already used by Mike van der Pan and his student Thorne in uh, two, 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 2004 for motion doodle, but for motion doodle, they did, didn't design new motion. They only reuse motion data and try to, to, fit the, to fit the motion data to the user sketches. So can, can we create really new motion by initializing our dynamic line of action or 2D surface from these sketches. So we need to interpret now the user, the user sketch has a space-time curve. It's, it's sketching in space and time, not only sketching 
in space. And we will, this will enable us to take drawing spin in, speed into account and then to, uh, to, uh, to design the rhythm of motion at the same time as the trajectory and shapes. So let us start with the flying motion. So if I want to, to model a dragon flight, if I look at the top, this is the way a current system would react. If you just take the shape of the keyframe one of the dragon and the keyframe two of the dragon and interpolate point by point the head of the dragon and its tail, then the trajectory will not be at all what the user wants. So the user could, uh, could instead give this trajectory for the center of gravity of the dragon and then try to, to, to accommodate, to design other shapes, but then he will need an infin a kind of infinite number of keyframes to get exactly the right shape at exactly the right part of the trajectories. So really, this kind of fly motion is extremely difficult to achieve with keyframes. So now if we want to interp interpret the blue curve at the bottom as a space-time sketch, what do we need to do? So the line of action should obvi obviously translate along the curve, and the drawing speed can give us the translation speed. So uh, our solution is that we just animate a, a window uh, uh, along this, this curve, and uh, using warping, uh, uh, an, uh, an adequate warping function here, which defines a window in pink, which will move uh, at the, as a speed where, uh, um, which can be extracted if we want from the sketch. The, the, the only the other benefits we can have by, uh, by having this is that optionally we can have squash and stretch effects if we, all, if we take, uh, take into account the speed at which it was, it was sketched also for defining the geometry of the character along the, along the curve. Then for the bouncing motion, we have this, this very easy bouncing gesture, and imagine yourself doing this bouncing gesture, you would naturally go slower when you go down, and then you go up again. So, so the, the timing of motion is really related to the way we sketch this kind of curve as well. So here, we, autom we take this blue curve, and we automatically set the, the lines of action keyframe we need in red here, and then they will be uh, interpolated, they will be automatically set from the trajectory. So in one gesture, we have some shapes and we have some, some temporal territory as well. And then we can kind of sculpt the resulting motion just by putting our cursor on one point along the curve and resketch the shape at this given point along the curve. So it's really a, a, a design system for, for motion where you can sculpt, sculpt in the sense of I have a, a th something and I'm progressively editing it and from coarse to fine and refining it and editing again and again. So you can really improve little by little your motion. For the loop, it's just a little bit more intricate. You also have this blue trajectory. Then you have uh, the red part, the red lines of action that need to be initi automatically initialized at, the, at the, the beginning and at the end of the motion. And we remark that what we want to, what we want to have in the middle is like the flying motion. The shape of the object you are animating should follow the curve. But if you make it follow the curve, then its center of gravity will be much lower than the user is, expense, is expecting. Look at the green curve on the right, on the top right. This is what you would, if, if, the, if the body of the little girl is following uh, exactly the, the loop given by the red curve, then you will have this kind of effect for the trajectory. We want it a little bit higher. So we make the, the shape follow the loop, but then we, we, we add a correction which puts it a little bit higher. And so here, here is what, is God, what, what, what it does. So uh, first, this is an example of an artist drawn animation, and then how people can, can do it again with our system. So this is a kind of motion which is very difficult to do with usual uh, uh, models. And now it, the user just drew a single space-time curve. And with this curve, you can have so this motion that we can then after that, you can very easily refine it, what I call sculpting it. So you, in one gesture, you have your first draft of motion. And then you freely refine it. So now we'll, we'll show that we can also uh, add details to a motion. So we stop at any time of the curve and we just edit the keyframe and we, we can of, of course 
add secondary line, secondary line of action from other viewpoints. And so just in two minutes, you have something difficult. So this is part of our user study. We were giving this example to people. And in this example, the dragon was just uh, 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 twisting along its axis. And so we provided a can technique so that the user can make the, the dragon twist along the trajectories. And this is the kind of result our users got uh, using this. So we have maybe, I don't remember exactly, maybe 20 users. And, uh, and the results compared to, to uh, of course, compared to keyframing animation, even keyframing with line of action with the previous system we had are really great. So uh, to conclude this, I would like to talk about the, the next challenges in character animation. Of course, this was a very beginning of work and I am I'm expecting a lot of other work following this to try to improve the way user can design motion using the uh, metaphors such as sketching, sculpting, but maybe al also many other different metaphors. Uh, for instance, uh, Karen Singh had a very interesting uh, work on, on, uh, on walking motion using the fingers uh, and, and then you, you use your own fingers on a, on a table and then uh, car uh, characters will, this is a way of using mimics or using gesture to animate, uh, free to animate content. So what I think are the main challenges is how can we sculpt or sketch interactions between characters? Because for, for the moment, it's only individual motion that we manage to sketch. How can we do it when several characters are interacting together? Now, when you want to edit group motion, would it be possible to use those, those technologies from, from coarse to fine, to have a kind of uh, sketch-based system which is coarse to fine, and uh, maybe coarsely sketch from, for the group, and then refine each individual motion? And then if you zoom on the face of the character, uh, or there is a very interesting work in our group on trying to use mimics to, uh, to make expressive faces. So we want to, trans to transfer the intention of the, of, the, of the people who control to the character, but not the personality. If you have a given character which has a given personality, uh, we, you can try to, to, to mimic for them what they, the, the expression they, they should have, but it's your intention that should be transferred, which is a difficult part. Another challenge is extending all this to natural phenomena. Imagine this, uh, this cup here. If you make it fall in some water, of course, in the physical world, uh, you will, it will fall always differently. If you just uh, do your washing and, and just uh, uh, drop your, your cup, it will never, never do the same. So th there is a full space of plausible motion. So how could we, could, could we uh, enable the user to sculpt within all this free space of plausible motion, but staying in this space of plausible motion. Uh, can, can sketching help for natural phenomena? I'm not totally sure. It would be very difficult. Maybe exploration from a, uh, 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 some first solution for kind of sculpting would be much more ap appropriate. There was uh, already a very nice paper from Chris Vautian uh, at uh, SIGGRAPH last year when he, he interpolated between several physically based animation. This is a start. It was only for fluid animation, but maybe this can be ex extended and also make uh, more interesting. This is also a solution we had in my group on uh, uh, the design of uh, waterfalls. So the, the design of my, uh, waterfalls, it works fine. The user can, uh, can uh, give a core sketch of what they want and we solve for a waterfall, but this is only for a stationary motion, which is always the, the, the same in time. So can we do that for more, for more uh, uh, general natural phenomena? And now I, I'm just coming to the, to the conclusion of the, the, this whole day on expressive modeling. So we have seen a number of new advances towards creating and editing shapes and also motion. And uh, I believe that what is really useful for people is to, be, uh, to have a system that enables them to progressively refine these shapes and this motion using gesture so that they can, they, they can uh, um, pro progressively get to what, uh, to what they want. So I'm, I'm not believi believing, like Karen said, that we have already the shape in our head and we just need a video out to, to show it to people. 
maybe he didn't, uh, I'm a bit provocative here, but, uh, but what I believe is that we create while we see something in front of us. So if you want to create a new stuff, maybe you need to start drawing. You cannot create entirely, I think, in, in your head uh, without having this first visual, uh, visual feedback in front of you. So what I would like the computer system to be is giving you the, 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 bet, the best vi uh, possible visual fi feedback in front of you so that you can design shapes, but design motion as well and design them in any order. What I didn't precise for Martin Gay's work is that when you, do, you, when you sculpt motion with a dynamic line of action, what is nice in interpolating motion for this line of action is that you can do it totally independently from the character which needs to be animated. So it's a first step towards being able to design motion even before the full character has been designed. And doing it in any, uh, so uh, imagine, Im imagine you have a story in mind and you want to experiment with a story. In this story, you have characters, you have motion, and can, being able to draft this in a coarse way, then you see this visual feedback, and little by little, you will precise what exact motion you want, which exact character you want, how they should behave. And I think this course to find uh, way is the best way, uh, at least for my experience, uh, to, to, to be able to, to create new stuff. So, uh, of course, the computer here is very helpful and uh, as uh, Eric said, to get rid of complex and repetitive tasks for which the computations by the, by the computer are much better than people. So, uh, replic replicating behavior, optimizing so that it exactly match and fits. And uh, so, I think that all our research at the end could maybe make human more creative because we'll have a better, much better than just a, a piece of paper and a pen to, to create something totally new with these new, these new interfaces. And so, uh, I'm saying again what I said this morning, graphics design but be seen as cognitive tools enhancing and extending our brain. So, it's a kind of augmented humans that we are doing by providing all these, the, the, these tools. But what I would like is to augment humans without instrumenting them as on, in the right. With, I, I don't think that we have the shape in our head and then you put like uh, sensors and we directly create the 3D model. No, I don't want that. I agree with, uh, with uh, Imetani, what he said uh, is that people uh, lo uh, love what they are doing when it takes time and they want to experiment with it and it, it's like if you had a, a relationship with, with your creation, I, th I think this is very important, keeping this in mind. And uh, that's all. This concludes this, uh, this symposium. Thank you. <laughs>